Welcome everyone uh, to the uh, first seminar of the Anti-Racism and the Law Initiative at Allard Law Faculty. I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging that I'm speaking from the unceded lands of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam First Nations, uh, whose laws and systems of governance continue into our present moment. And when we think about the most recent uh, war on terror, I'm mindful of the forms of violence and terror that lie at the foundation of the settler colonial system. It gives me uh, a lot of pleasure to uh, kick off this uh, seminar series. Arlie is a newly established, loosely configured crew of faculty concerned with the relationship between race, racism, and the law. And we are interested in thinking about how law is embedded within infrastructures of racial subordination and also how law has a special place, shall we say, in perpetuating uh, racial and intersectional inequalities. This seminar is being co-hosted by the Center for Business Law of which my colleague, Professor Carol Liao is director. Uh, as well as the Indigenous Legal Studies Program, of which my colleague, Professor Patricia Barkaskis is academic director, and also the Center for Law and the Environment, of which Professor Stephen Wood is the director. So thank you to um, all of those centers for co-hosting the seminar. Uh, now, before I introduce our speakers, um, I want to extend a very warm welcome to Professor Nagai Pindel, who I'm happy to uh, say is the new Dean of Allard Law Faculty uh, as of November. Uh, Professor Pindel will be joining us from the University of Las Vegas, William S. Boyd School of Law, where he has served as Vice Dean of the Law School, Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs, and Vice Provost and Special Advisor to the Executive Vice President and Provost. Um, in addition to uh, all, of, all of this um, uh, administrative experience, he is the International Gaming Institute Professor of Law and was central to the uh, introduction of the Masters in Gaming Law. Um, and he has researched and published widely in the fields of property law and affordable housing, community development, and trust law amongst several other fields. And I'm going to turn it over to Professor Pindell just to say a few words now. Well, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Uh, I also wanna welcome everyone uh, to the discussion today. I'm very honored to join you uh, today for this important conversation. And I hope to meet many of you in person soon. Um, I'm joining you from Las Vegas, Nevada today, and you know, as I wait for uh, uh, approval from the immigration um, authorities, and I'm racing for the, for the transition from the desert to, to a rainforest. Um, I look forward to listening to the panelists. Um, thank you for, for participating in these challenging um, and sometimes painful conversations, but of course they're necessary and they are timely. Uh, I wanna thank my colleague, uh, Bren Brenna Bondar for inviting me, and thank you to all who are on this call for engaging uh, this topic. And with that, let me turn it back to Brenna and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from the panelists. Great, thanks so much, Nagai. Um, okay, now I'm going to introduce our three speakers and uh, I feel like I, there's so much I could say about each of them. They're all incredibly accomplished. I'm really excited to hear them on uh, our theme for today, um, but I'm going to keep the introductions fairly short so we can get on with listening to them speak. Um, first up, we'll have Natasha Bakht, who is a full professor of law at the University of Ottawa and the Shirley Greenberg Chair for Women and the Legal Profession. Um, professor Bakht's research interests are generally in the area of law, culture, and minority rights. And she looks specifically at the intersecting area of religious freedom and women's equality. 
In the field of family law, she has co-written a textbook entitled Families and the Law. And Natasha is also the uh, author of the um, monograph, which has a wonderful title, In Your Face, Law, Justice, and Niqab Wearing Women in Canada, uh, which was published just last year in 2020. Uh, next, we'll hear from Arun Kunani, who is uh, author and freelance scholar affiliated with the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. Arun has a very long association with the Institute for Race Relations in the UK, and more recently uh, has taught at NYU, amongst other institutions. Arun was author of an extremely significant report on the prevent policy in the UK very early on in, that, in the life of that uh, policy. Some of you may be familiar with it. And his critically acclaimed books include The End of Tolerance, Racism in 21st Century Britain, which was published in 2007 with Pluto Press. And more recently, uh, the highly critically acclaimed book, The Muslims Are Coming, Islamophobia, Extremism, and the Domestic War on Terror, which was published uh, with Verso in 2014. And finally, we will hear from Professor Sunera Tobani, who is based in the Department of Asian Studies at UBC. Um, Professor Tabani's research is located at the intersection of social science and humanities, and she works on critical race, post-colonial, transnational, and feminist theory, amongst several other fields. Um, she has been a leader in, um, in, in the field of critical race studies in Canada, um, and she's author of uh, the groundbreaking book, Exalted Subjects, Studies in the Making of Race and Nation in Canada, which was published in 2007. And more recently, uh, the book, Contesting Islam, Constructing Race and Sexuality, The Inordinate Desire of the West, which was published with Bloomsbury uh, just last year in 2020. Uh, so it, 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 it's wonderful to have all three of you here, and uh, we will start uh, with uh, Professor Bach. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Professor Bandar, for the invitation to speak today. I am honored to be among such distinguished panelists. Before beginning my talk, let me also acknowledge that I am speaking to you from unceded Algonquin territory, where I have been an uninvited guest for many years. I am mindful of the important reminder that land acknowledgements provide to take seriously the implications for each of us of living together in a good way, and in a way that furthers reconciliation with Indigenous friends and family. So I'm going to speak today about the perpetuation of gendered anti-Muslim racism and how it has found through niqab bans a reliable and a conducive transnational route in law. Niqab wearing women or Muslim women who wear face veils in liberal democracies have for some time been read in very particular ways, in ways that really don't coincide with their lived realities. Many people assume that by wearing the niqab, these women accept subordinate status to men, that they are forced into this attire, that they do not or cannot work in the paid labor force, that they are boring, and that they prefer to withdraw from society. The niqab wearing woman is simultaneously read as in need of our protection from the sexual subordination that she endures at home, and one from whom we need protection for the offense that her clothing expresses. One of the earliest justifications for the war in Afghanistan was to save the women behind the burqa. The public narrative around rescuing Afghan women from oppression by the Taliban greatly influenced the meaning ascribed to both the headscarf 
and the face veil in liberal democracies. However, this idea of niqab wearing women as victims has changed. It's changed rather dramatically, such that in many parts of the world, she is now viewed as an aggressor, as one who cannot be trusted, as one who children fear, and one who deliberately seeks to offend. As a result, we have seen a proliferation of niqab bans. Bans or attempts to ban the niqab have traveled global circuits, leaving in their wake disastrous consequences for Muslim women who wear the full face veil. Now, though these women are a minority in terms of their numbers, they have evoked in politicians and the public, urged by politicians, a repugnance that insists on erasing them from public spaces. And the repugnance they inspire requires, I think, that we pay close attention to the transnational roots of legalized anti-Muslim racism. So first, an analysis of niqab bans reveals that a transnational proliferation of racist methods of regulating Muslim women's dress occurs through law. So France was the first country in 2010 to prohibit face veils in public spaces, relying on, among other justifications, the novel perspective that face coverings hamper social relations and make living together impossible. France's national prohibition on face veils was followed by eight other countries, Belgium, Bulgaria, Austria, Denmark, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Chad, Congo Brazzaville, and Sri Lanka. Regional bans of the niqab or bans affecting certain sectors, such as, for example, the receipt of public services or voting, have been enacted in Canada, Spain, Italy, Germany, Syria, Cameroon, Tunisia, Algeria, Niger, China, and India. Numerous other countries have debated, proposed, or had failed attempts at prohibiting face veils. And those countries include the United Kingdom, Egypt, Indonesia, Estonia, Finland, Hungary, Slovenia, Latvia, and Lithuania. So these multiple and widespread attempts to regulate Muslim women's dress are, they're both sobering and they're supportive of the idea that discriminatory and racist laws and practices in one country lend backing to similar strategies in other countries. Parallel discourses from different regions of the world demonstrate the interconnectedness of gendered anti-Muslim rhetoric and the ways in which niqab wearing women's demonization is both shored up and made local. So for example, Quebec has drawn on the French foundational principle of secularism, claiming it a common Quebec value as one reason justifying the prohibition of niqabs. Now, setting aside the relatively new emergence of secularism in Quebec's political history, niqab bans of this sort also demonstrate the very particular racial logic that is borrowed from France's interpretation of the principle. Second, an analysis of niqab bans reveals that they have been initiated by politicians to protect majoritarian values. So in each of these countries that I mentioned, calls for niqab bans emerged because political elite formed an agenda to protect majoritarian culture against a potential menace. And the menace, of course, is niqab wearing women. Politicians really transformed niqab wearing from a non-existent issue to a spectacular threat to the nation. Politicians have insisted 
that niqab-wearing women do not belong to the nation state, despite vociferous declarations by the women themselves that they very much belong to the nation. Niqab-wearing women are construed as a threat to the shared values and practices of nationhood because it is assumed that they are connected to Islamic terrorism or Islamist ideals. In Belgium, despite a national crisis that divided the Francophone and the Flemish elite and that paralyzed federal politics in 2011, politicians were somehow able to coalesce in large numbers around the idea of banning face veils. Anti-Muslim racism emerged as the symbolic ground upon which national unity became articulated. This narrative of national belonging has been used by politicians globally to demarcate the conditions under which Muslim women may inhabit the public sphere. A third feature of niqab bans is that their justifications are based on specious logic. Indeed, they are grounded in a powerful illogic that need not cohere on any level. Many niqab bans are defended on the basis that seeing the face is required for reasons of communication, identification, and security. In fact, the COVID-19 health pandemic has revealed how disingenuous these justifications are. Face coverings, which are now government mandated in many public spaces, have not prevented effective communication. It is very possible for societies to function um, while having parts of their faces covered, um, people can still interact, communicate, and perform their regular functions. When, when it has been necessary to identify people, such as in hospitals, in order to receive certain treatments, staff have simply relied on identification documents. Now, security arguments are similarly irrational because needing to see someone's face at all times does not increase the safety of society. As the Human Rights Committee noted with respect to France's ban of niqabs, and I quote, general bans on face coverings for security purposes are too sweeping in their means and not proportional to the objective in question. The insistence that seeing the face at all times is necessary is actually about the subjective feelings of discomfort or unease of the majority toward a minority practice that causes no harm. Now, I would suggest that comfort or ease is an ineffective measure for interactions in a diverse society. It also seems to make no difference that niqab bans can produce absurd results. So in the current global health pandemic, one can be fined for not covering one's face, and women who wear the niqab will also be fined or penalized in other ways for covering their faces. Finally, some bans are rationalized using gender equality on the erroneous assumption that women are universally coerced into wearing this garment, despite empirical research finding that many women who wear the niqab do so as an expression of their faith. In six of the liberal democracies where interview-based research has been conducted with niqab-wearing women, most have stated that they made the personal choice to wear the niqab after prolonged periods of thought or study because of a desire to lead a faith-based life. Now, decisions about clothing are almost always made in relational contexts that undoubtedly constrain and influence behavior. But the regulation of Muslim women's clothing explicitly questions their capacity to make agentic choices in ways that other people's decisions are not scrutinized. 
So for several niqab wearing women in Canada, the decision to wear the niqab meant acting in defiance of their loved ones or having to convince family members that it was an appropriate choice. The gender equality justification for niqab bans is also entirely insincere because a true concern for these women would not impose the devastating consequences of these kinds of prohibitions. Niqab bans limit women's ability to work, to travel, to testify in courtrooms, access healthcare, education, and other public services. They potentially criminalize harmful, harmless activity with fines and imprisonment, and they subject niqab wearing women to violence on the streets. The gendered consequences of niqab bans are far reaching, and they thwart the very prerequisites that are needed to ensure women's equality. Niqab bans have moved from one country to the next, adopting similar strategies and rhetoric that become localized expressions of anti-Muslim racism. The narratives that circulate within, between, and among these countries reinforce false, illogical, yet effective ideas about niqab wearing women as untrustworthy and abhorrent. Repugnance and aggression toward niqab wearing women become part of a shared vocabulary or a repository of civilizational superiority that operates irrespective of the specificity of each national context. And it forms, as Professor Shireen Razak has put it, a circulating anti-Muslim affect. If there has been a war on terror, it has been experienced acutely by Muslim women who wear the niqab. Exclusionary laws and policies aimed at a despised or a feared minority prompts outcomes that go beyond the legislative text. Muslim women's experiences of harassment and assault in public worsened during controversial episodes in which the niqab received specific and specific political and media attention. When law abandons logic, and coercive power is used for the purpose of preserving majoritarian values, a range of appalling consequences are legitimized. Niqab bans, and I'll just end here, also I think indicate a very worrisome view of our societies. We risk organizing ourselves according to the simple binaries of good versus bad and civilized versus backward, leaving no room for self-criticism and no way to think about how we might open ourselves up to the rich diversity that others can offer. So I will end here. I really look forward to hearing from our other panelists. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. That was, uh, that was really great. Um, I just wanted to mention before Arun uh, speaks, uh, if you have questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A uh, function on the screen, which you'll find at the, at the bottom. I'm sure everyone's <laughs> overly familiar with this by now. And we will have a Q&A in time for discussion after the final speaker. Okay, so Arun, I'll pass it over to you now. Um, thank you, Brenna. In fact, thank you to uh, everyone who's been involved in, in organizing this. Um, so I'm one of those, I'm someone who's been kind of writing um, and been active uh, around issues to do with the war on terror for a long time. And what I've been trying to think about over the last few years in particular is how, how we might um, get out of the kind of pattern of kind of reacting uh, to the, the kind of constant flurry of new initiatives that, that uh, we've seen under the heading of the war on terror and, and start to be able to include in our work um, something like a proposal for alternatives, um, however modestly and, and, and um, tentatively we might do that. 
So, so you know, what is our alternative uh, proposal? What's our alternative argument um, about what security might look like? And and um, I think in in the last um, year, but obviously it's something that's been going on for much longer. We can we can um, draw here on the on some of the resources that have come out of the Black Lives Matter movement, I and mean, in particular the abolitionist politics that that has embodied. And that's that's um, where I want to start um, this afternoon. So, you know, last year while the um, COVID nineteen pandemic was was uh, raging, um, something like uh, fifteen million people. Um, participated in Black Lives Matter demonstrations across the United States. And my my um, my presentation is going to focus primarily on the United States this afternoon, but um, I think a lot of what I'll be saying is is going to apply more broadly. Um, now, as, as as with any movement within it, there's there's kind of a diverse diverse range of motivations and orientations. Um, but the abolitionist approach, I think, is is particularly striking in in those movements. Um, uh, influenced by black feminist politics and queer organizing and the radical notions of care that those traditions embody. Um, abolitionism is a mode of, of political thinking and practice that has emerged from, from 20 years really of organizing against the prison industrial complex, um, abolishing prisons and defunding the police are kind of its most kind of prominent aims, but at, at the core of abolitionist politics is, is a, an attempt to reconceptualize the notion of security. And that's what I'm, I'm kind of, um, interested in here. So um, the logic that dominates the criminal legal system involves thinking of harm as a problem that can be solved through officially san sanctioned uh, punitive violence, right? And, and this has two consequences. First, it means that the um, criminal legal system intensifies rather than reduces the circulation of violence, um, giving rise in turn to demands for more police and more prisons. Uh, in a kind of perpetual motion of criminalization. And second, it means that attention is, is diverted from examining the underlying social and economic causes of what we call crime. Um, and, and prisons instead serve to kind of screen off the social problems that result from capitalism um, by hiding criminalized groups of people from view and, and forgetting about the social questions that, that, that they raise. And of course, racism is, is essential um, as, as a kind of lubricant of that whole process. So um, abolitionism instead proposes the creation of social institutions embodying um, a broader sense of security, um, meeting educational, healthcare, childcare, housing needs, um, as, as well as de decriminalizing drug use, sex work and migration. And in addition, abolitionists propose the creation of justice systems based on uh, reparation and re reconciliation rather than retribution and vengeance. Now, um, what I'm interested in particular is how an abolitionist approach can apply not just domestically um, within, the, within the domestic criminal legal system in the United States, but to the institutions of global security. Um, and in this, um, you know, abolitionism is, is drawing upon the legacies of a black internationalist politics in the United States, uh, for, for black power organizers um, in, um, in the late 1960s, for example, um, the black freedom struggle in the United States was, was understood as one element in a kind of international movement for liberation. So as um, H. Rat Brown, uh, one of the black power leaders at the time put it, um, there is no difference between Harlem and Puerto Rico or Harlem and Vietnam. Right. So in other words, what he's saying there is, is there is an overlap between the structures of police violence at home and the structures of military violence abroad. Like the criminal legal system, the US national security system abroad um, spreads rather than reduces violence in ways that are often organized through racism. And it distracts us from addressing the social and eco ecological problems uh, the planet faces. Um, so, you know, the war on terror um, provides, I think, a good illustration of these processes. So researchers at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University have documented the deaths of around half a million people in Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan as a direct result of the war on terror uh, from October 2001 to October 2019. Um, around half of the deaths are, are, dis are described as, as civilians. Um, and of course, this is a highly conservative estimate because it only counts for documented deaths directly caused by war. The actual death toll of the war on terror is going to be much higher. Many of those 
killed have not been counted and many more have died indirectly as a result of the destruction of infrastructure um, that people depend on for food, water and health. So deaths resulting from um, war-induced malnutrition and environmental damage are likely to far outnumber deaths from combat. So we don't know, we just, I mean, we don't know how many men, women and children have been needlessly killed by the US and its junior partners, such as the UK um, in the war on terror. But the, the number is definitely over a million. Um, and at the same time, over 14 million Iraqis and Afghans have been forced to flee their homes in fear of their lives. Um, the overwhelming majority are uh, violently prevented from seeking sanctuary in the US or the other wealthy countries who share responsibility for their displacement. Uh, now, uh, the mass violence of the war on terror has been carried out by the normal agencies of state power. So the regular militaries, the intelligence agencies, the law enforcement agencies, the border agencies, the, pri the private contractors and the courts. Now to understand how violence on this scale can be administered through the ordinary processes of nominally liberal states, I think requires that we understand the particular form of racism um, that's bound up with, um, with the war on terror. And here, I think it's helpful to turn um, to uh, one of the kind of key um, ideologues of, of the war on terror, uh, the former uh, British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, um, who um, described the, the wars as aimed not actually at regime change, but at values change, his term, values change. Um, and he'd been influenced by neoconservative scholars such as Bernard Lewis, um, and come to believe, in thinking about the war in Iraq, come to believe that Iraqi cultural values were so antagonistic to his idea of uh, liberal matern modernity, that only a war to tear apart Iraq's social fabric would make possible the new kind of Iraq that he envisioned. And this is part of what he called, to quote, an elemental struggle about the values that will shape our future, a war, but not just against terrorism, but about how the world should govern itself in the early 21st century. So it seems to me this um, sums up the logic of the war on terror in a nutshell, uh, that, that state violence is held to be necessary actually not primarily to prevent terrorism, but in order to bring about a cultural change among Muslims around the world. Um, and it's, you know, we don't see this made explicit that often by the kind of political leaders of the war on terror, but, but that argument I think is central. And of course it, it carries a terrifying implication, which is that the cultural problems in Islam are seen as so deeply embedded that they can only be dealt with through the kind of uh, mass industrial violence that destroys millions of lives. So anti-Muslim racism is therefore indispensable to the war on terror. Only by imagining barbarism as somehow a natural feature of Islam can war, torture, assassination and arbitrary imprisonment be presented as necessary. Anti-Muslim racism functions here by setting aside all the contingent social and political factors that create the conditions in which some Muslims do indeed carry out acts of terrifying violence, um, and instead seeing their actions as simply the necessary expression of an Islamic culture of fanaticism. Uh, and then we can tell ourselves that their violence reflects the deep flaws of their culture, while our much greater violence is a rational, even liberal program of modifying their barbaric behavior. Genocidal violence does not always announce itself in the rhetoric of overt hatred. It can also be couched uh, in the managerial language of cultural reform. Now, at the, at the ideological center of the uh, War on Terror project is a distinction between the moderate Muslim and the extremist Muslim. Um, the moderate, is offered a form of inclusion. The extremist is subjected to state violence. But since the moderate is perceived to be always at risk of becoming an extremist, all Muslims are continually suspect. War on terror administrators talk about radicalization as the process by which moderates are kind of gripped by an extremist Islam, transforming them uh, according to this idea, into violent fanatics. So vast systems of surveillance have been established to try to identify the would-be extremist Muslims among the moderates. Now, in practice, uh, the classifying of Muslims into these two categories is not a matter of um, explicit and consistent criteria. 
moderate Muslims are defined as, uh, for example, those who restrict their religion to the private sphere. But they are also expected to publicly condemn interpretations of Islam that Western governments consider dangerous. Moderate Muslims are supposed to value freedom of speech, but they are considered extremists if they use their freedom of speech to criticize the West. Moderate Muslims are required to publicly condemn the use of violence to achieve political ends, but when the US government uses violence to achieve its political ends, condemnation must give way to consent. Officially, Muslim extremism is defined as a rejection of liberal values, but in practice, the term is almost always used to label Muslims who oppose Western power. Moderate Muslims have uh, what is regarded, is regarded as their cultural identity, celebrated within a framework of diversity and inclusion. Extremist Muslims, on the other hand, have their mosques and community organizations closed down. Um, they uh, have their clothing regulated, as, as Professor Bakht has been talking about, their speech criminalized, uh, their bank accounts frozen, um, even their citizenship canceled. Um, if they live in the Middle East, in Africa or in South Asia, they're subject to execution from the air by missile bearing drones or transportation to secret locations to face torture and indefinite imprisonment. In the cases of, of Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, entire countries were invaded, occupied and destroyed. Now, the war on terror has been um, declared to be over. Um, I suspect it's merely entering a new phase. But in any case, I think um, what we need to focus on in this particular moment of transition is the broader national security infrastructure within which the war on terror um, sits. Now, um, what does that look like? The US currently spends over $1 trillion a year on national security, uh, which is enough to provide COVID vaccines to everyone in the world and a global safety net to prevent anyone from falling into poverty because of the virus. Um, the US military has 2 million people uh, residing across 800 bases in 90 countries. Uh, last year, it ran covert operations in 154 countries. It has 3,800 nuclear warheads and plans to spend $100 billion to purchase 600 more nuclear missiles uh, from defense corporation Northrop Grumman. Uh, the US remains the world's largest arms exporter with its share of arms exports rising to over a third of the global total over the last five years. Now, this kind of scale of the US's um, military infrastructure is almost completely accepted as the taken for granted background to US foreign policy making. Um, yet, it actually provides no security for ordinary people. Um, the US national security system did not prevent well over, uh, I think we're now on 700,000 people in the US losing their lives to COVID-19 in one of uh, you know, in one of the um, of the richest country in the world with with the world's highest per capita death toll. Um, instead, the response to COVID-19 was to mobilize anti-Chinese sentiment in response uh, to justify an escalation in spending to counter the rise of China. Uh, the US national security infrastructure has itself been a major contributor to the greatest danger uh, facing the US population over the coming decades, which is the heating of the planet. Uh, the US military is the largest institutional emitter of carbon in the world. Instead of reducing its emissions, the Pentagon has presented climate crisis as a new rationale for its existence. It says the US military is a necessary source of order in a world of climate driven mass migration and extremism. So even the catastrophes of climate crisis and pandemics have been folded into the racist logics of national security. The general pattern is, is that US security policies exacerbate the insecurities that they are ostensibly designed to minimize. It's a record of failure that can only be described as pathological. Now, that failure um, arises for two fundamental reasons, in my view. Um, first, US national security policies rest on a fantasy that the US can secure itself through unchallenged domination of the world. Uh, today, the policy establishment deludes itself that the US can return to the 1990s when it appeared to have achieved a stable US dominated world order. Uh, for um, liberals, uh, as much as conservatives in the foreign policy world, al any alternative to such a strategy of restoring what they call US primacy is simply not considered credible. Uh, 
but the US needs to confront what is actually the end of its unchallenged dominance. And that means recognizing the injustices through which that dominance was established, uh, including white supremacy, including imperialist warfare, and including uh, settler colonialism, um, including uh, the place where I am uh, currently, uh, the stolen land from the Cayuga Nation, otherwise known as, as um, New York State. Um, and this brings us to the second reason for the failures of US national security policies, um, which is that they typically involve racist assumptions about the United States' supposed enemies. The Washington foreign policy bubble is adept at imagining racial monsters that need to be slayed at all costs, only to find that ordinary people rebel against the violence the US has deployed, dragging both sides into an ever deeper spiral. Uh, that's the story of Iraq and Afghanistan, but it's a much broader story too. In a sense, the US has never stopped fighting so-called savages at its frontiers, even as the frontier expanded to the global battlefields of the Cold War, the war on terror, the war on drugs, and so on. These all involve what Franco Fornari describes as the incredible paradox that the most important security function is not to defend ourselves from an external enemy, but to find a real enemy. Um, the depth of commitment to this racist and self-defeating mode of security is, is illustrated by the rage unleashed um, whenever anyone, particularly a person of color, tries to challenge it. Consider Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's modest efforts to question the record of US foreign policy. In response, uh, she has been accused of everything from supporting terrorism to marrying her brother for immigration purposes. Now, while US national security policy fails to provide security, it has, of course, been very successful in other respects. It's an economic success for the military and security corporations and the think tanks they fund. But above all, it's a political success uh, for ruling elites in managing the global fallout of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism depends upon racially coded global divisions of labor that render vast swathes of the human population superfluous to capitalist production. Projects of, of counter-terrorism, counter-narcotics, uh, border militarization are all directed at effectively managing this um, humanity deemed surplus. And in turn, this provides a material basis for the recurring upsurges of nationalism and racism that flourish under neoliberalism. Now, it's obvious today that a chasm has opened up uh, between official narratives of national security and uh, the actual security needs of ordinary people. Uh, we face uh, three major dangers to our lives over the coming decades. The climate crisis, pandemics, and social breakdowns due to unabated racial capitalism. Uh, unless these interlocking dangers are addressed, we're going to see ever larger numbers of people facing disease, destitution, displacement. The free market will continue to hollow out our capacity to achieve democratic change and racism and nationalisms will fry. Um, the abolitionist argument would be here that genuine security does not result from the elimination of threats, but from the presence of collective well-being. It means building institutions that foster the social and economic relationships needed to live dignified lives, rather than reactively identifying groups of people who are seen as threatening. It rests on dominant, not on dominance, but on solidarity at both the personal and at the international level. Uh, of course, things like climate change and pandemics can only be addressed from an internationalist perspective. Um, and in the long term, it's illusory to achieve security for one group of people at another's expense. So we're going to need a progressive defunding and shrinking of the US's bloated military intelligence and border infrastructures the con and the construction of alternative institutions that can provide collective security in the face of environmental and social dangers. In fact, a majority in the US favors cutting the defense budget um, and reallocating those resources to health and education. Twice as many people support such a cut to the defense budget as oppose it, but public support um, for this kind of military defunding lacks the momentum and energy that comes from any kind of organizational power, which is the only force capable of overcoming the vested interests and ideological barriers that stand in its way. What all of this points to is the need for intensified organizing to dismantle the US's global infrastructure of violence, to prioritize care over killing, and embrace the reciprocity that constitutes humanity. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Aaron. That's uh, really provided us with so much to, to uh, think about and discuss in the Q&A after as well. Um, so yeah, just a reminder, please feel free to type in your questions um, into the Q&A and we'll have time for um, some discussion after our next and final speaker. Uh, so Sonera, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I would like to begin also by thanking uh, Dr. Brenna Bandar and all of the organizers of this panel for inviting me to speak here today. It is a great honor. Um, I'd also like to begin by recognizing that we are on indigenous territory at UBC, Musqueam territory, and I live on Coast Salish territories. And I just want to highlight the point that the land acknowledgement, I think, uh, needs to recognize also that indigenous peoples are involved in struggles of sovereignty over their lands. And so it is a kind of gesture of solidarity with those, with those struggles for sovereignty um, that uh, I'm sort of trying to highlight as important uh, when we uh, recognize the lands that we are on. Um, so I will, I'm drawing uh, mainly, sorry. <clears throat> Okay, I think we're okay now. So I'm drawing mainly on my recent book uh, to uh, think about Islamophobia and the challenges that Islamophobia has left us with as the kind of official uh, declaration comes that the war on terror is over. Uh, the construction of Islam as a religion of violence and the conflation of the Muslim with the terrorist in the aftermath of 9-11 shaped uh, not only uh, national uh, ideologies in support of the war on terror, but also transform the global political landscape. Um, these Islamophobic uh, constructs of Islam as uh, death oriented um, continue to stay with us. And uh, you know, uh, the Bush administration of course made them central to the ideological formation of the war on terror. Um, these constructs had an immediate impact on the citizenship, rights, and status of Muslims in the US and in Canada, but around the world. These constructs and the related attacks on Muslims were, however, also reinvigorating what Stuart Hall calls the idea of the West. That is of the West as a cohesive, stable, and unitary entity. And in the particular aftermath of 9-11 as a superior cultural and civilizational entity that was under attack from a pre-modern fanatic enemy who was utterly incommensurable. And so I became really interested in thinking about how the idea of the West itself was being reformulated and for me, that helped me understand how much public support there was for uh, the invasion of Afghanistan, including from feminists. Um, and so I kind of, you know, became much more interested in looking not only at the impact of the war on terror and Islamophobia on Muslims, but also on this idea of the West and how it was that Western forms of subjectivity and sovereignty were also being transformed through the global war on terror. So along with the war on terror's new alignments of allies and enemies, it was also redefining this idea of the West. And by that, I mean that Western identity, culture and politics were being reconfigured through state policies and popular practices. The West and its subjects have therefore been redefined in and through the global war on terror in a manner that was no less profound than the redefinition of Islam and Muslims. The Bush administration's infamous formulation of the clash of civilizations to justify attacks on Muslims and to launch the invasion of Afghanistan materialized this ideological binary between the West and Islam, which now became the worst of the rest in state policy, domestic as well as foreign. 
Moreover, the targeting of black and brown bodies as terroristic demonstrated how closely race was intertwined with religion in the Islamophobic discourses of the war. Um, racial profiling, of course, is nothing new in uh, the US, Canada, and many other parts of the world. The profiling of Black communities in US and in Canada was well established before 9-11. But what we see with 9-11 is an explicit and public sanctioning of racial profiling to protect the nation, to secure its interests, and to deal with the security threat. And so we see here how you know, there is a kind of new uh, level to which uh, racial politics are being intensified, but also a way in which race and religion become uh, uh, you know, mutually constitutive in the discourse of Islamophobia. So the eruption of racism against Muslims, the erosion of their citizenship rights was taken up by Muslim communities who really started to organize against this very early on in Canada and the US and other places. Critical scholars and activists who built bridges with these communities also confronted this racial targeting of Muslims and took up quite rightly so the struggle to defend the citizenship and rights of Muslims. Yet how the global war was remaking Western identity and subjectivity itself, and how both race and religion were being mutually redefined in contemporary Islamophobic ideologies and practices has received very little attention. So in my presentation, I want to make a number of key points about Islamophobia. First, even as Islamophobia legitimizes violence against and the disenfranchisement and dispossession of Muslims, this discourse also serves to restabilize the West as an internally cohesive political cultural formation and gives this, few, this uh, formation new content in a changing world in a new century. The second point I want to mention is uh, gender and sexuality are central to Islamophobic discourses. My point here is that Islamophobia does not only set up Muslim men, women, and sexual and gender minorities up for particular forms of violence and disciplinary projects, but Islamophobia became the grounds for the remaking of Western gender and sexual politics. Third, as the ideology of the war on terror, Islamophobia is now deeply embedded in global politics, and it became key to the remaking of the international liberal order that has been in place during the mid 20th century. Fourth, with the defeats of the US uh, alliance in its various wars on terror, Islamophobia has led to the mainstreaming of white supremacist and other allied ultra-nationalist politics in the US, in Canada, and elsewhere, South Asia being a really good example of this. So here in this talk, I can only offer very brief comments to expand on these four points. So first, the idea of the West and uh, what I'm calling its reformulation. The West, of course, has never been a monolith. Its meaning, identity, and culture are disparate and internally driven. So white supremacist versus multiculturalist politics, for example, neoconservative versus social democratic. But the idea of the West also shifts in relation to the contestation of its power by the different communities that it incorporates into its domination, which includes the colonized and indigenous peoples of every continent. It is also the case that Western nation states now face unprecedented competition on their own grounds from an economically vibrant China intent on extending its sphere of influence, not only across the Middle East now and Central Asia, but across Africa and the rest of the world. The West also faces the challenge from a politically emboldened Russia contesting the US domination of the greater Middle East and Europe but it is in Islamic terror 
that the West identifies its existential enemy. It is with regard to Islam that the most frenzied passions of the Western alliance are unleashed. And I think this difference really matters. Uh, in terms of gendering Islamophobia, and you know, my argument, this is also a gendering of the West, a reworking of the gender politics of the West. The idea of the West that is now reiterated in various national politics and in global politics defines this entity as superior and under threat because it's of its advanced cultural values. The idea, ideology of the war thus sutured over the ruptures that had been intensifying in the previous decades of globalization within the West, divisions of class, race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, nationality. Islamophobic constructs, however, redefine the West gender and sexual norms as essentially egalitarian and as signifying the Western commitment to quote unquote freedom. Gender and sexual egalitarianism was thus transformed into the distinctive cultural property of the West, Islam, their absolute enemy. And I think this helps us understand how many feminists uh, were drawn into supporting the war on terror, even though they might have opposed their particular states on a number of other issues. But it was in the construction of Islam as hyper misogynist that we see a kind of feminist and other progressive constituencies colluding with the global war on terror. The construction of Muslim men as hyper, hyper patriarchal and misogynist and Muslim women as passive recipients and passive victims of this male Muslim violence redefined Western men, women and gender sexual minorities as freedom oriented, as inherently and essentially life oriented. Western women and queer communities now became emblematic of the West superior cultural values. Muslims were here defined as death oriented in relation to this freedom oriented Western subject. Consequently, the relations among the contending constituencies within the West, gender and sexual in particular, were reconfigured as were their global alliances and enmities. The war on terror thus gave new feminist and queer content to Western identity and politics, especially in the global arena. And this is going to this construct of uh, uh, gender sexual politics is so deeply embedded now, it's going to stay with us for quite some time. In terms of remaking the international order, the, British ad the Bush administration's designation of the Muslim as terrorist and unlawful enemy combatant instituted a distinct status in international politics that would have catastrophic effects on Muslim societies far beyond those caught in the immediate zones of the war on terror. Fanon may well have described the event as bringing into being a new subspecies of colonized life. The alchemy of Western paranoia re-ontologizing the post-independence figure of the Muslim into that of the terrorist. While critical scholars were quick to describe the development of, of uh, this development as exclusion, ejection of Muslims from citizenship rights, the transformation, I argue, heralded a much deeper remaking of the law itself and a deeper in corporation of the figure of the Muslim into the formation of Western identity, culture, and politics. Each element of the designation, unlawful, enemy, combatant, destroys the post-independence gains, such as they were, that were made by Muslim societies after the Second World War, and reconstructs them as the very antithesis of the modern social order. Islam and Muslims are defined as threatening the destruction of law and politics, ethics and morality, that is the values and institutions that produce and sustain modern human quote unquote civilized life. The designation now materialized in law of this, uh, the designation was materialized in law through the spectral clash between an innocent West 
and an evil Islam by fixing Muslim being as an illegitimate form of being now stripped of the rights to have rights in Hannah Arendt's words. The global wars ushering in of the new era of invasions, occupations, and proxy wars has led to the undoing of the liberal international order that was in place since the Second World War. Neoliberal policies had, of course, begun to undermine this order, but the war on terror marks the undoing of this international order in earnest. What will replace it, we're not yet clear, but you know, there has been a fundamental shift that has been organized through the global war on terror. In Canada, the US and Europe, the war exposed the hollowness at the core of liberalism's promise of multicultural inclusion. Canadian Muslims suddenly found themselves the target of racial profiling. They were subjected to increased state violence and also became targets of vigil vigilante violence. The state's linking of anti-terrorism to national security and to immigration and refugee policy made these communities suspect a threat to the nation. The Islamophobic discourse of cultural barbarism continues to construct Muslims as pre-modern, misogynist, homophobic, basically in racializing terms that have not lost any of their potency. In the global South, I argue the war demonstrated the limits of national independence for the previously colonized Muslim world. The construction of Afghanistan as a terrorist haven and soon after of Iraq as stockpiling weapons of mass destruction that would soon become available to terrorists legitimized the destruction of both these states and their respective societies. In each case, violence and destruction of rights became legitimized in national and global politics as the modality of governance of Muslims. And this has not shifted. Moreover, the inscription of Islam as the sign of global terror has made adherence to Western power, to Western norms and cultural practices, the only condition for Muslims to be recognized and for them to have, quote, the right to have rights. The older racial binary between civilization and barbarism that had been discredited in the mid 20th century institution of the liberal global order, a shift that had been brought about by anti-racist and civil rights movements in the global north and by nationalist movements in the third world was thus reinstated by situating the figure of the Muslim at the center of this remaking of the international order. And finally, the politics of white supremacy. The ramifications of the global war are also to be found in the growing divides within the West itself, as white supremacist movements moved into the political mainstream. With the inability to claim quick victories in Afghanistan and Iraq, the divisions among US corporate, political, and media elites have intensified. As the US-led alliance lurched from one monumental disaster to another, its Islamophobic and racist politics have grown in intensity. The simmering rage of white supremacists that has been harnessed by ultra-right movements to confront the ambitions and domination of their inclusionary and multiculturally minded neoliberal elites is going to have long-term effects. This internal transformation of national political landscapes by white supremacist movements are a direct result of the global war, as is the escalation of violence against Black peoples in the US and around the world, against other racial um, uh, people who are produced as minoritized through the racial politics of their particular nation state. And this violence is also not going to subside anytime soon. The white supremacist politics and extremist movements that have plunged the Western democratic order itself into an unprecedented internal crisis cannot be read outside the context of the defeats of the US alliance in its war on terror. The long-term effects of these ominous shifts 
have yet to be seen, but these have already redefined transnational alliances and enmities, forms of subjectivity and sovereignty in a fairly profound manner. And the institutionalization of Islamophobia may be considered, if we may call it that, one of the successes of the global war on terror. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Sunara, for that um, really fascinating talk. And uh, we've got a couple of questions in the um, Q&A. So I'm going to, I have lots of my own questions, but I will um, uh, read out the questions that are in the Q&A. And um, I think the first one is, probably directed at all three of you. So um, if you have responses, we can um, maybe just stick to the order of um, um, uh, in which you spoke. So the first question is, are there any recommendations for members of the legal profession on how to mitigate the harmful impacts of anti-Muslim political agendas and mainstream media rhetoric? Um, so that's an interesting question, and I will turn it over to uh, Natasha to begin the discussion. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks so much for the question. Um, yeah, it's an, it's an excellent question. I think that as legal professionals, we do need to be thinking about um, uh, how to combat these kinds of uh, discrimination and racism. I mean, I think first of, first off, you need to name it, um, even if it's in a, um, a, a case that it might appear sort of minor, you need to name racism. Um, I think that, you know, you have to point out the failures in logic, the absence of evidence, and use the legal tools that are available to us to really combat discrimination, misogyny, racism, and oppression generally. And I always find that, especially when it comes to um, gendered Islamophobia, an, an intersectional approach to rights offers um, a very helpful perspective in terms of how to get at um, the multiple rights that are often at issue um, when we're speaking about Muslim women, for example. Um, I would also say that um, for legal professionals in, in sort of this era that we are in, and I'm thinking, of course, of Bill 21 in Quebec, um, which uh, has been enacted, I shouldn't call it Bill 21, it has in fact been enacted into law, um, which says that, you know, you cannot be um, a member of the public service, you know, a key member of the public service and wear a religious symbol. Um, and of course, in sort of the ordinary way in which constitutional challenges are happen, I think that most people agree that that law would be found to be discriminatory. Um, but because uh, the government of Quebec has invoked Section 33, um, legal professionals really need to be innovative and creative in their advocacy. Um, at this time. Um, and so you need, we need to start thinking about sections of the charter that perhaps have been underused. And I'm thinking, of course, of um, section 28, the gender equality provision. And I'm also thinking of the multiculturalism provision in section 27. Um, and then, you know, on a broader view, I think we need to be thinking about whether provisions like section 33, which really undermine our ability to uh, constitutionally challenged through the typical avenues, um, laws that are clearly uh, problematic, whether we should still have Section 33, whether it has a function um, that is justifiable. And, and I would say that it doesn't. And so we need to think about repealing that and you know, possibly engaging in some um, constitutional um, amendment discussions. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, I, I was going to actually suggest that maybe uh, we all leave our cameras on now for the Q&A. So uh, Sunera and Aaron, if you would like to, great. Um, did you have anything to add to that question about advice to legal professionals about how to, um, uh, I thought, I, I suspected Natasha would have the most concrete sort of answers uh, back, but do you have anything to add Aaron or Sunera? Uh, I, just quickly, 
I, I would just say, look, I think across, you know, across um, US, Canada, Australia, Europe, um, you know, in lots of different ways, Muslims are um, unable to use the law as a remedy for the kinds of violence and harm that they're experiencing. And there's kind of two key reasons for that. One is um, a, a sort of general problem that, that um, you know, access is it in a word, right? Access to, to, to um, lawyers who will advocate for you, access to um, resources that that requires and so forth, right? So, and the second problem is, is that we've created in all those countries um, in various ways, a kind of parallel criminal justice system that, that operates through the terrorism laws in particular, um, uh, and, and that treats and that treats Muslims as um, as 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 kind of to be to be diverted through this separate kind of shadow criminal justice system, right? And so, I think, given that that is the nature of the problem, the you know what legal professionals can do is is you know is is try as much as possible to be involved in in organisations at community level that can provide legal services to people who don't normally have access to them. And secondly, is use the the professional expertise that you have to um, to call for the uh, and to organise the, um, the the scrapping of, of um, the whole legislative infrastructure that cre that creates this kind of separate system for Muslims. Um, so, um, I think that the issue of access is really important, and also the protection of rights especially in a moment when they're being undo, undone so so rapidly and so quickly. So certainly I think that it's really, really important that the struggle for access and protection of rights be part of you know, whatever political projects we're involved in at this moment. But I think we also need to go beyond the kind of rights-based framework. I mean, we shouldn't forget that the law itself is central to the organization and the production of racial hierarchies, that the law has actually been central, particularly here in Canada, to the dispossession of indigenous peoples, the ongoing violence that indigenous peoples continue to experience. And so law has been central to making of the nation in a particular kind of racialized formation. So I think it's really imperative that the kind of, you know, uh, legal community uh, be engaged in some kind of rethinking of the space of law itself in producing race, in producing racial um, hierarchies. Uh, the rights-based framework has brought us to this point. And I think that this moment, the kind of tremendous upheavals that are going on around the world, the kind of you know, unleashing of state and vigilante violence to keep the order in place, is something that I think should be of major concern to the kind of you know uh, 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 legal professionals, and of course, protecting the rights that uh, people have is absolutely crucial. But that can't be the end goal, because you know the rights-based framework, as I said, has brought us to this point. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that's great. That's a, a wonderful set of answers to that question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, the next question is uh, directed to uh, Arun, and the question uh, states, you talked briefly about how the Pentagon is positioning itself as a new source of order, if I caught that phrase correctly, to deal with climate change and resulting impacts. Could you say more? Where did the Pentagon uh, where did the Pentagon position this way, and what has been the reception to this positioning? Has this resulted in, say, increased budgets? Thanks from uh, M. V. Dramana. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. It's a that's its phrase that it uses to say it's a, it's a source of order um, in a world of of climate crisis. And so this is a this is a, a kind of rationale that the Pentagon's been putting out in in its own report since, um, well, almost two decades now. Um, and um, 
uh, and so it, it models a world in which as, as, as climate crisis intensifies, more and more people are on the move, and therefore, um, in its view, the risk of terrorism and extremism increases, and um, its role as, as a protector of, of the US from those threats um, becomes more salient. And, and so, you know, what you get is the picture of, um, I mean, you know, the Pentagon is saying it offers the United States um, an armed lifeboat solution to climate crisis, essentially, right? It's like the US can, can kind of wall itself off from the crisis unfolding globally, thanks to the Pentagon. And um, of, A, that's not actually gonna work even, in, even for the people of the US, and B, um, of course, um, it exacerbates the very problem um, because um, it means that we divert more and more resources to, um, to military solutions um, to what is actually a, ecological crisis not a not a um a military crisis and we um you know we we fund um the largest institutional emitter of carbon in the world um uh i don't think and it, it's plausible to say that there has been a direct relationship between um the the perpetual increase in the pentagon's budget and that particular argument but it's but it's part of the general argument that the pentagon makes every year to justify its budget um increasing and um, and will become more, you know, and it's becoming, you know, it's a it's a massive thing under the Biden administration right now. The, the, the Biden administration has appointed, um, uh, I forget the exact title, but there's a kind of, in the newspapers, it's described as a climate czar um, uh, with cabinet level responsibility in the Biden administration. And, and the climate czar sits on all the task forces to do with um, the, the Pentagon and the military. They are clearly seeing this, this kind of interaction, right? And so what you get from, you know, a, a sort of Biden administration, but equally the same would be true of conservative administrations. Is this armed lifeboat response to climate change? And of course, for conservatives, it's it's a fascinating contradiction because they will simultaneously deny that climate change is reality while also wishing to make the United States an armed lifeboat uh, in the face of it. And those two will coexist in the in the um, uh, irrational conservative mind. It is particularly chilling that uh, this um, militarized, securitized response to climate catastrophe, and we could have another seminar on that, I think. Um, okay, there's there's another two-part question uh, from uh, Shiraz Ramji, and I'm going to uh, sort of um, paraphrase a little bit as well, or add some things onto the question. So. Um, the first part of the question is, what is the impact of the victory of the Taliban in Afghanistan on Islamophobia? And I want to add a supplement to that question to ask if you could maybe speak a little bit uh, about how the West has been very central in fabricating this Taliban uh, historically. So just giving a little bit more of the the history of how the West is implicated in fabricating the, the boogeyman specter that it then uh, um, uh, uses or places as, as the way, you know, Sonera talked about it as it's really, it's the, the big existential threat to the West. Um, and the second part of the question uh, states, women leaders in Afghanistan have identified the American war in Afghanistan as a feminist war. I'm not quite clear on what the question is asking, but this is the question. Um, can you comment on this challenge to European American feminism? So, um, uh, yeah, so that that's the two part question. Okay. I can, no, sorry, you should go ahead. Okay, okay. <laughs> Um, I'll take a short stab at the question, but I think um, especially your supplemental question, um, Brenna, I think I'll, I'll let uh, Professor Tavani answer that. You know, I think for me, I worry that the um, impact of the victory of the Taliban um, and, you know, we are hearing that women in Afghanistan are now being forced again to, uh, to wear the niqab. And, you know, the state should, of course, never be in the business. No state should ever be in the business of telling women what to wear, what not to wear, right? That's really um, sort of a, the primary basic starting principle. But I worry that with, uh, you know, the proliferation of media stories about 
uh, women in Afghanistan who are now being forced to uh, by the state to wear the niqab that it really um, or the burqa that it really undermines um, the choices that are being made by women in liberal democracies. And I, I said in my talk that, um, you know, clothing choices are always relational. They're always dependent on um, a variety of factors, but we don't tend to question um, or scrutinize the choices that are made by um, uh, women, by other people. But when it comes to Muslim women, we really scrutinize their choices and we undermine the very words that they are saying. So as I said, you know, I've done interviews with niqab wearing women in Canada. Those interviews have been conducted in six other countries. And overwhelmingly, the women have said, we wear this because we want to live a faith-based life. And there seems to be an incredulity um, uh, to hearing that. Um, to hearing that. And, and that incredulity is something that we need to get over. Um, but I worry that um, the Taliban's victory is going to make that more difficult. Um, I want to just say one other thing, because I don't want to be entirely pessimistic, but I think one of the things, the silver linings of the uh, COVID-19 global health pandemic has been that we have seen people functioning in society with their faces covered. Whereas before the global health pandemic, niqab wearing women were really unusual, you know, and they recognize that they, you know, in my interviews with them, they said, we get that people are not used to seeing us, but that has really shifted. That has really changed with the global health pandemic. And some of the women who I've interviewed have suggested to me, and I, I don't suggest that this is a, a universal perspective, but that, people, ordinary people's reactions to niqab wearing women have also changed. That there seems to be an ability to now step back and say, oh, okay, maybe um, my views were a little narrow-minded. Um, and maybe I can look at face coverings as simply that, a face covering. Sometimes it's worn for religious reasons and sometimes it's worn for public health reasons. So, um, my hope is that the victory in, um, of the Taliban is not going to undermine some of that silver lining that I think we have seen as it pertains directly to uh, niqab wearing women. And I think I'll just leave it there. Oh, can I just say one other thing? Um, and that is um, in, in response to the sort of second part of Mr. Ramji's question is that gender equality is always used as a way to try to say that um, Muslim women's dress should be regulated. So in I, I named a number of countries where we have niqab bans. In almost every single one of those pieces of legislation, the preamble talks about gender equality as being a reason for enacting this particular law. But we have to really probe what, what gender equality means. If it means leaving behind religious women, um, you know, that can't possibly be our vision of gender equality. It has to include um, the rights of religious women. Thank you. Um, should I go yeah. or Arun? Uh, go, go ahead. Uh, okay, so it's it's a very big question. What is the impact of the, of the victory of the Taliban? I think we have to wait and see. Right? We have to wait and see what the impact of, of, of this is going to be. Uh, few things were very clear. The violence is not going to subside. Uh, American interference in Afghanistan is not going to subside. Uh, what kind of proxy wars are now going to be fought out in Afghanistan? Uh, China, Russia, all of them, India, all of them have a real interest in what happens in Afghanistan. My sense is that a lot of the violence will be used to demonize the Taliban. But I think we should see Afghanistan as, as the site of a kind of ongoing war that's going to be fought out, not in the same manner, but in different ways. Uh, so I think that you know, paying attention to who are these different groups, right? What is the role of external powers in the violence that we are seeing even at this moment in Afghanistan, but that we will see, uh, you know, over the kind of in the near future. Uh, 
Um, the issue of refugees is also really crucial to think about, not only Afghanistan, but the war on terror created millions of refugees. And you know, we saw that Europe and North America have responded by a, uh, you know, shutting the borders and also being very, very selective about which refugees they're going to be accepting from uh, the different countries where the war has been, has been fought out. So the refugee crisis is just going to be horrendous. I think that all of us can anticipate that. Uh, so, you know, this will all uh, kind of, you know, uh, go into the assessment of what is the victory of the Taliban. Um, in terms of the challenge to Euro-American feminism, um, I mean, my argument for some time, not a very popular one, has been that feminism has become the language of imperialism. Feminism was the language of the global war on terror. And feminists were incorporated into actually waging the war. Feminists made huge gains in the US, for example, in the military, media, spokespeople, all, all, you know, all of the ways in which women in the West, in the US particularly, did, did, did make gains. The whole NGO community, for example, feminists were hugely invested in reconstruction projects in Afghanistan. And so I think that you know, some kind of critical approach to feminism and and to gender politics is really crucial. But with Islamophobia, Muslim women can only be heard if they speak the language of Euro-American feminism. And if they speak the language of gender equality, right? And you know, the big question is, what does gender equality mean in a situation of war, of a global war on terror? How does one separate the idea of gender equality when violence is being used as the modality of governance of that entire society? So I think we really have to complicate our kind of discussion and debates in gender politics. Uh, you know, there is a kind of way in which the lowest kind of common denominator now dominates any discussion. Of, of what feminism means, what gender politics have become in this particular moment, in this particular juncture that we're living in. Um, okay, I wanted to give you the chance to respond Aaron, to that, but it's a massive question and actually we've run out of time. Um, so um, I, I can't thank you enough for these uh, really brilliant and rich um, papers, and I um, am so pleased that we could hold this seminar. And uh, thank you to the audience for uh, tuning in. Um, the whole session has been recorded, and we will be uh, posting the link um, somewhere, <laughs> I think, on the Center for Business Studies. Um, um, for business law, sorry, or or some other site on uh, on the Allied Law Faculty website, we'll circulate it. And um, yeah, so so thank you, thank you once again, and um, yeah, thanks thanks for everyone who tuned in. Thank you. Bye.